think we're going to um, get going. So it's two or two, so another minute or two. Hi, Shelby. She's muted, but hopefully he hears me. I'm here. Hello. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. I was just looking you. for Reiner. Is he on his way? I think he should be, yeah. All right. How many people normally come to this sort of thing? Um, it varies, you know, this has been, an, as you will know, a bit of a challenging time of sorts. Um, <laughs> Indeed. And so people have various, various challenges and, and problems that usually we, we, you know, some are average out between 15 and 20 for these things, um, you know, which is, I think, a good start for us, but it's also, we are like a little bit at a point, I don't know if, if you agree with that, but unfortunately, most of us are a little zoomed out at this point. Oh, so yes. the, the idea, which is unfortunate in particular, if one invites really wonderful speakers like yourself, that at this point, what was a year ago exciting and you know, everyone jumped on any giving opportunity at this point almost works against you, that it's harder, you know, just to still keep people excited. So. I think it's time for us to do again some events in the old fashioned way where we shake hands and see each other. That is, if, if we get come to that point and feel well, safe and your, all that. Hasn't your governor just opened everything up in Texas? It doesn't mean that, that we feel all particularly safe or good about it. And the <laughs> UT system has for now in, a, in our universal wisdom decided that we're gonna adhere to our rules, meaning uh, we still, want students, staff, faculty to wear masks. We have really cute looking ones with, you know, a logo on and all that. And that seems a lot better than not wearing any. And here's Professor Schulte. He's muted. Hi, Lionel. He's waving. All right, then I think we are all here and um, we are ready to begin. I know we are also in our Zooming lives all very busy. And it's Friday and we want to get this going also because um, we're in really for something very, very special. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you all again and to welcome in particular our distinguished speakers, Francois Meltzer. We decided a minute or two ago not to proceed from here on in German, which she could have easily done, but we rather want to stick it out in English, which is, I think, to the benefit of all of you. Uh, but let me just introduce her quickly. She's the Edward Carson Waller, Distinguished Service Professor in Comparative Literature at the University of Chicago. She, her specialties are in French and German literature and critical theory. So she's in many ways really a comparative um, scholar. She has written widely. Um, she published Seeing Double, Baudelaire's Modernity into 11. That was good timing, I think in the same year she edited a volume, Saints, Faith Without Borders. Um, if you ask Elsner, and then also two years later, she edited a collection of essay, Derrida's essays. So this was 211 to 13, must have been slightly busy on, on your horizon. Uh, but we are today really fortunate, and I feel very fortunate that she's here to talk to us about one of her more recent publications. It came out in 2019 with University of Chicago Press, Germany 1945, Dark Lens. Imagining Germany in 1945, which is a really unique discussion of photos and the aftermath of ruins and the way they are being captured. I was fortunate to have a dear friend, Rainer Schulte, uh, who made me aware of this book very early on and uh, made sure that I had a copy of it quickly um, and sent it onwards. So I've been a fan of this already for quite a while and therefore very excited um, to have you here today. Thank you so much joining us, Professor Meltzer, and I'll hand you over now to you. Thank you very much. I wanna thank uh, UTD for inviting me um, and the Dean Nils Rimmer for inviting me as well. And I especially wanna thank my dear friend and former teacher many moons ago, Reiner Schulte, 
Um, and I want to thank too um, <clears throat> Christy Barris, who's been helping me with the te technological part in which I'm sort of, uh, shall we say, challenged. Um, so thank you for coming. I know it's Friday. Um, I want to talk to you about this recent book that, that Dean just mentioned, Amy Dark Lens, Imaging Germany, 1945. Um, it's about the ruins in Germany during the last years of World War II. I have to tell you right now, I wouldn't say this is a fun, cheery talk, but stay with me and I'll do the best I can. <laughs> um, so it's about Allied bombing at the end of World War II. And I, in the book, I look at texts that try to describe this bombing and the devastation and painters who do that as well. One is Karl Hofer, who was a famous painter in Berlin. Um, and the other is Anselm Kiefer, who continues to be very famous. Um, so I end the book with a, a series of photographs um, taken shortly after the bombs had fallen. Um, and one of the many questions I ask here is um, whether Aestheticization, voyeurism, or a historical perspective, even if it's informed, actually prevents seeing the war ruins depicted. In other words, I'm asking what the debates and questions are, accepting the, you know, concerning the quote unquote acceptability um, of suffering under certain circumstances of war. Um, such as when the victims as here are viewed as the undisputed enemy um, and purposely targeted. So it's an ethical issue. Can catastrophe, I ask, be persuasively represented? Are there any conditions that would allow for targeting civilians? So we're not talking about collateral damage, right? Which is when somebody dies by mistake because someone else is targeted. We're talking about targeting the civilians. Um, so I'm going to show you several photographs from the book today, and they were taken by my mother, uh, Jeanne du Milieu, in 1945 with a Zeiss camera. They'd never been published, and they were hidden away in a trunk of family photos since they had been taken. And many of them were taken in Berlin, but because I don't know exactly where each photograph takes place, I haven't identified any of them geographically. So let me just give you a little context. My mother, who was French, had been in the resistance during the war. Um, I never learned that from her, by the way. I found out by mistake from friends of hers when I was in my 20s. So when I asked her why she never told me she was in the resistance, she said with some contained anger, today everybody says they've been in the resistance. So I have nothing to say. And as I'm sure you all know, it was a very tight-lipped generation. One of the strange things that happened to me as I was writing this book is I realized I had a certain reticent style that I'd never had before as if I were challenged, channeling these people, you know? So when my father married my father, who was American in 1945, he was in the State Department and serving in France. But upon marrying, he had to leave the country, given that his new wife was a French national and thus uh, created a security threat. She might have been a spy. My father was thus transferred to Germany. And my mother consequently found herself living in Berlin amid a population in a country that she detested. Uh, moreover, State Department rules stipulated that wives since there were no husbands in the State Department at the time, um, were not permitted to work. So unhappy at being forbidden to work, she'd had a successful career in France. My mother told me she began taking photographs to keep herself busy. And because the ruins were so portentous a presence everywhere around her. And she also said this, uh, and this is all she told me about the photographs. She said the entire time she photographed the ruins, she was constantly torn between a feeling of serves you right, bastards, and human empathy, um, a profound humanitarian response to the suffering of which the ruins 
were stark witnesses. Um, so she said that photographing the ruins was completely exhausting precisely because of these two extremes. Now, as I'm sure you know, the German population after the war was desperate and starving, trying to emerge from the rubble, straining to return to some version of normalcy after Nazi rule and ideology, stunned by the defeat of the Reich, for many a defeat that was met with disappointment and incredulity, and assaulted by the brutal invasion of the Red Army, the vast number of raped women is still unknown. To this was added an immense loss of lives and homes caused by the continual allied bombing. Um, the literal as well as psychological shell shock produced by trying to survive in constant fear with destruction everywhere. Uh, the German population at the end of the war was utterly traumatized. And so I come back to my book's questions. How does a photograph describe the results of catastrophe? Does it merely record mutely as a witnessing? We tend to witness reluctantly and not infrequently with purient interest. And when photographs we read uh, an undertaking I'm gonna engage in here, uh, is there a redundancy in verbally describing what a photograph already depicts? Is the silence of a photograph betrayed by verbal explication? You know, like a silent movie in which a soundtrack is superimposed by a later era, or like a black and white film that is subsequently quote unquote colorized. So the images I'm gonna show you were produced of course before the digital age with its photoshopping and other technical capacities and before the constant snapshots of the cell phone. Um, these black and white images are taken, we should note, at the apogee of the camera, um, that is the 1940s. The fact that they were not meant to be propaganda in either case, and that they are the work not of a professional but an amateur, suggests something like a possible moral ambiguity. And we can talk about that later. Moreover, and this is complicated, they can't be understood as art, quote unquote, unlike, for example, images produced by professional, highly regarded photographers. Um, and yet, I've been told by people I've shown them to that there's a beauty of sorts in these images, so that one wonders on what grounds it can be said with certainty that they are not art a question to which I do not have an answer. And I should add that there's a lot uh, in these photographs that the viewer does not and cannot see. Ruins and devastation from outside the frames, things that can't be zoomed in on um, to be viewed more clearly, people who are cut out of the scenes, reconstructions that have already been undertaken but are cropped out and so on. The images, like any image, leave a great deal unseen and unrecorded. On the other hand, the viewer may leave, <clears throat> may see things that the photographer never intended, right? The photographer's indexicality is not something we as viewers need obey. Yet the imprint of a photograph, its materiality, does necessitate a response, a recognition of, for example, the image as a container of historical memory or as an aggression on the part of the photographer or on the part of the image itself or any number of other possibilities. I mean, it's also the case that any image, particularly of catastrophe, can lead to anesthetizing or mummification, as a colleague of mine puts it, of the image and or the viewer's gaze. What, in other words, do these photos want? Um, I'm here channel uh, channeling the, the title of a book by my colleague W.J.T. Mitchell, What Do Pictures Want? Um, 
nobody really believes that pictures want anything, right? But as Mitchell says, pictures are like living organisms to us, even if intellectually we know that that's absurd. To what extent can we project ourselves backward more than 70 years to the end of the war and try to get a sense of these images of a ruined Germany? So let's start with a beginning. Um, I'm gonna analyze two sequential photographs, um, but since I don't have time to do them all, this is a first one. So I should say that I grew up in the ruins of Germany, even though I was born after the war. Um, and uh, so in many ways, this was a book I felt I had to write. Uh, these are memories and images that have never left me. Um, you will notice that the rubble is carefully piled up. Uh, the people who did that were called the Trümmerfrauen. Um, because the men were largely at war, they were the ones who cleaned up. And I must say that most of the point was to clear the streets for the victorious armies. I'll talk about this later, but it should also be noted that there are people dead under the ruins. Um, and I got in trouble with this, with a reviewer who got upset because I said that as I look at these ruins, for me, the Holocaust was hovering above, just as the dead bodies were buried below. Um, I'll talk about that later too, and I'll come back to this image. Shall I go on? Mm -hmm. Next image. Please. Okay, so this is a sequence, as you can see. Uh, there are two well-dressed young men who stop to view a destroyed bridge. And behind them are more ruins, buildings, roads, churches. The city has clearly been recently bombed, although again, the rubble has been removed from the street to allow for circulation. Mainly, as I said, for the vehicles of the victorious army. And you can see that the church in the background is already under construction. Can you see that? Hmm. Anyway. Um, in this scene, the bridge has been temporarily reconstructed with wooden planks. See those men are walking on wooden planks to make it possible for pedestrians to walk. Now we know that the two men stand there for a while because the military truck that appears when they decide to move on is not visible in the background of the first photograph, right? There's the military. Can you see my cursor? Probably not. No, we, um, do. Hmm? we do, we do see your cursor. Oh good, okay. Um, so in the first scene, the men stand in what seems to be contemplation at the destruction, right? In the second, they hurriedly, hurriedly move on as if they've seen enough. The first man's tie is flapping in the wind, his head turned away from what he's just been looking at. And the second man is looking directly in front of him, though one wonders why his right arm is on the balustrade. They're grimacing a bit, but it's hard to know if it's from the effects of seeing the ruins or from the sun that seems to be hitting them directly in the eye at a slant from the right, or if they're squinting with some curiosity at the photographer who is meeting them head on. The military truck complete with soldiers is rumbling behind them. We don't know the nationality of the two men looking. Do we assume, for example, that if they're German, it is the extent of the destruction that's making them grimace. Or if they're French, again, for example, their facial example is merely caused by the sun or their interest in the photographer. Their attire, I hope you will agree, does not suggest that they are American. Are they French journalists? And what of the soldiers in the truck? 
we assume that the conquered Germans are no longer driving trucks. So this one probably belongs to the allies. Now, I should add that any good historian of the war would know immediately to whom that truck belongs and who the soldiers are inside it. So are they Russian? Are they part of the Red Army that just finished pillaging, plundering, and raping its way through the Reich? Perhaps the two men have moved on because of the truck's appearance. The war is over, but you never know. In that case, the men are most likely German. I don't know if you can see this, but two of the three soldiers in the truck are also grimacing. So maybe it is just the sun or maybe they're noticing the photographer. We have, in other words, very little information about these photographs, except that we know at this point that they were taken in Germany at the end of the war by Jeanne du Milieu, amateur French photographer, period. The photographer has captured a scene of two men coming to grips, one might say, with one result of the allied destruction of cities and towns. Her gaze is trained on that of the men. In the first photograph, the men are staring at the bridge. In the second scene, as they walk away, their eyes are looking directly at her while she looks at them. And we, the beholders, as Michael Fried would put it, are not exempt from all of this. In the second scene, everyone is looking at us, even as we look at them. Moreover, the men you will notice are not put in the middle of the photograph. The photographers contextualize the frames in order, we suppose, to be inclusive so we can see the ruined bridge, the background of the ruins, the two men, the military truck. So no doubt for the viewer of these photos, there is a studium here, as Roland Barthes so famously put it. He says, quote, it is by studium that I am interested in so many photographs, whether I receive them as political testimony or enjoy them as good historical scenes." End quote. On the other hand, there's little here that would produce Balth's notion of punctum, which he calls, quote, that accident which pricks me, but also bruises me and is poignant to me. <laughs> Barthes argues that to recognize the studium, quote, is invariably to encounter, now this is interesting, the photographer's intentions, he says, Barthes, right? To enter into harmony with them, to approve or disapprove of them, but always to understand them, to argue then within myself, he says, because, he continues, culture is a contract arrived at between creators, and consumers. For Bart, representation is an obvious function of the photograph, which serves, quote, to inform, to represent, to surprise, to cause, to signify, to provoke desire. But what is the intention of the photographer here? It's not as easy and obvious as Bart tries to make it. In these two scenes, for example, is it historical recording, curiosity, pleasure at the visible vengeance on Hitler's folk, recording for posterity. One might also say that my mother is recording the erasure of urban history. In other words, the cities were flattened and then they were reconstructed very quickly. Um, Clearly her goal was not aesthetic, that is to capture beauty. She seems rather to be recording destruction and loss. There's so much fullness here that we can't unpack. What was she facing in photographing these scenes? How much did she know? Did she understand her work as building history or an attempt to hold on to history? And we don't know. In that sense, the photographer is as opaque as her subjects. We might assume that the primary goal in Dumoulin's photographs is to record the war's structural and architectural devastation. 
people in this collection, I have about 40 photographs. Um, and I, I have about 30 of them in an appendix at the end of the book. And I noticed that people are quite incidental in this collection, though the ruins return us inevitably to the suffering of the populace. The face is not the focus of these images. Although in these two uh, photos, we have people, but you'll notice you can't see their faces. What's interesting about this photograph is that, oops, can you go back? Um, you see the patches of light? It's because there are no roofs on the buildings and because there's no panes in the windows, but it's mainly a lack of roof. So, but do you see what I mean about the populace? Uh, let's look at the next photo. And there's no people at all, right? And there's that sort of creepy entrance into nowhere. Um, so you see what I mean, um, faces, Oh yeah, and that's interesting too. And I'll have a lot to say later about briefcases and bags. Um, everybody who looks at ruins photos notices the briefcases and the bags. Um, my explanation for that is a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it is that people went to the uh, black market to try to get food. And the way you deal with that when you come back home um, is by having some sort of carrying bag that doesn't look like a grocery bag, right? Since it's black market. So faces are the exception in my mother's photographs. She stays at a distance from most of her subjects. It's as if she didn't want to get too close uh, to get to know her subjects in order to engage, uh, engage with them. So. You know, it's like the French resistance fighter does not seem to want proximity to the German population she's photographing. There's a kind of discretion here, as well as the suggestion one might conclude of a certain antipathy. It's thus likely that the two men in the photographs that we saw earlier are friends of the photographer, given that unlike most of the local populace, they are rather well dressed and that the photographs are taken from fairly close range. Very few, if any of the photographs in this collection that I have show Germans looking straight into the camera. Here's an exception, although it's not clear what the nationality of the soldier is, but he is looking right at the camera. Um, he's talking to the driver of an American in a Jeep. Right. I'll leave this here. Look at the ruins in the background. They're just incredible. Um, so Christy, let's go back to the first picture. Uh, on the back of the photograph, it's written in pencil. Berlin, May 1945. It is impossible, of course, for us to view this image in the same way the Berlin population must have done at the time or would have done at the time. But we can consider what we see. Metaphors abound to describe the site of any ruin. The gaping holes that were once windows stare out ominously like so many skulls piled together. The jutting and twisted steel beams cluttered by heaps of rubble rise like arms begging for help. Perhaps the street has in fact already been shoveled as I mentioned earlier, though as you see, we can't see the street. Inside the rooms themselves, I hope you can see this, uh, we can see the traces of staircases that have been ripped off by the blast and charred walls. Behind these shattered structures, other houses can be partially seen. They appear to be in somewhat better shape, though there seem to be no window panes. It was apparently primarily a residential area. 
So you'll notice that a good deal of my description anthropomorphizes these ruins, you know, staring, gaping holes, the arms of jutting metal. It's as if the absence of people in these photographs necessitated applying human characteristics to the fragmented edifice in an effort to understand them, to capture what is often referred to as their empty gaze, to take it all in with our own gaze. Ruins, writes the historian Werner Sollers, seem hauntingly anthropomorphic. There's words like ribs, wounds, vomiting. Now I've willfully engaged here in familiar ruin descriptions of ruins of modern war, may I add, not of antiquity. For the ruins we have here are the result of war technology and not of time's erosion or of nature's return to dominate what had won, once been a city. So in other words, it's not the romantic notion of ruins, which is a whole other subject. So let's say that this is a raw ruin um, created in several instants by airplanes far above their targets, continued by delayed bombs and fires. And to go back to what I alluded to earlier, it's not really the case that there are no people here. They're simply invisible, buried under the rubble. Most Berliners during air raids took shelter in the cellars, hoping to escape being crushed under collapsing buildings. Many died in those cellars, either trapped by fallen debris or asphyxiated by the fires that raged after the air raids. Berlin, I should note, was bombed by the Allies for four years and by means of 45,000 tons of uh, bombs, which is pretty incredible, I think. Um, it's also true that there were fewer deaths in Berlin because the city is very spread out, unlike other cities which are very knotted together. Nevertheless, people died buried alive. Hundreds of thousands were left homeless, wounded, dazed. One journalist who was an eyewitness wrote, quote, where there is a direct hit, you can imagine what a mountain of debris a five-story building creates. The people lie within that mountain, he said. Some were never found. Russian prisoners of war carefully cleared away one stone after another, and they were getting nowhere. Down in the cellar, people were banging, and not a single one could be rescued, end quote. So my point is that this is not an image without people. They're trapped under the mountain of debris. Among other things, this photograph provides the, uh, provides the image of an invisible cemetery. I said at the outset that I was attacked by a critic for writing that in this image, if the dead lay under the ruins, for me, the dead of the Holocaust, as if hovered above it, haunting the scene. The critic asked how I could prove that. Well, of course I can't prove it. It was an emotional response that I had and I continue to have quite firmly. Death, in other words, hovers above and is buried beneath the ruins. And the ruins are like a no man's land separating the two groups of the dead. And may I say, there is no way to talk about the bombing of Germany without having the Holocaust constantly in mind. And that I might say is one of the things that made writing this very difficult. Thank you, Christy. Does knowing that the rubble and the broken buildings are undergirded by dead bodies change our view of the photograph? I think for many viewers, it does. The rubble, which otherwise looks like a straightforward pile of rocks and debris, begins to take on a kind of intensity or sinister aspect when we know that it's covering hundreds and hundreds of corpses. Dominic Lacapra has argued that when a historian goes about explaining trauma, the explanation itself will be determined by the specific subject position of that historian. I would say that's true of history in general, but a photographer is such a historian only in part because the images are frequently less overtly readable than a historian's written text. What Eric Santner calls the transfer, 
<clears throat> transferential dynamic of the viewer uh, to the event will construct a particular gaze on the photograph. So one of my questions in this book is how is the gaze constructed, right? So how, part of the answer is how you see these photos will depend among other things on your perspective, your politics, your historical views, your age, your gender, the time elapsed between now and the scene photograph, your knowledge of the events, and to repeat the nature of your relation to them. You notice that's an American military vehicle parked in front of the ruins there. A German viewer may respond, we can agree differently from a French one. The photographer is here still the same, the amateur French woman. Is she exultant in this example of what had contributed to the very recent Allied victory? Or as a reporter would, is she showing the horrors of the war machines? Or perhaps both, which would align her with the contradictory feelings I mentioned at the outset. These images take on as well a certain tension that we sense in the two photographs of the two men that I started with. We witness horror and uh, mourning, for example, or conversely, a certain unspoken or unacknowledged gratification for appeasement and perhaps everything in between. All of which brings us inevitably to the question of blame or revenge. Susan Nyman write, writes that, quote, Auschwitz stood for moral evil as other crimes did not, because it seemed deliberate as others did not. So remember that for a second. Nyman argues that how we judge evil is determined as a matter of intention. Quote, where evil intention is absent, we may hold agents liable for the wrongs they inflict, but we view them as matters of criminal negligence. And she continues, alternatively, anyone who denies that criminal intention is present in a particular action is thought to exonerate the criminal, end quote. So this is precisely the source of anger produced by Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, right? The whole notion of the banality of evil, the assumption that guilt requires malice and forethought, and that by denying these in Eichmann, Arendt was absolving him of responsibility. She was not, as Nyman among others, not to mention Arendt herself, made very clear. And by the way, in parentheses, when I first came to the University of Chicago, there were still people who remembered uh, people in the faculty club getting up and leaving when they saw Hannah Arendt out of protest. But if we return to Nyman's point that moral evil is at its height, Auschwitz, when the crime is deliberate, we're entering very problematic waters with respect to the Allied bombing. For the bombing of German civilians during the Second War was nothing if not deliberate. So here we have a couple walking down the street in Germany. It's the spring of 1945. The street has been completely cleared and cleaned and a military convoy is about to drive by unobstructed. And another one is going in the other direction. The couple seems unaware of the photographer. The man is barely visible. We can see a bit of the profile of his face. He's blocked by the young woman walking with him. She's somewhat out of focus. The camera is focused on the ruins, but seems to be averting her eyes from the pile of ruins to her right. The man is looking straight ahead, also apparently avoiding the rubble. In the background, if you can see him right there, um, on the other side of, a ro of the road, another man is hurrying off somewhere carrying a briefcase. Were it not for the ruins, this might be an ordinary scene. Notice the woman's wristwatch. 
prominent on her left arm, which one might read here as time has started again. Now the Hotel Darmstädter Hof, which is, was here, um, has been destroyed and some of its large lettering obliterated. In the background is a mountain of debris that is no doubt covering over a good many corse, corpses. Is this couple here German? Then it is surprising for the time that they are so well dressed. The woman, for example, seems to be wearing nylons, somewhat of a luxury at the time. Why is this woman so healthy looking and not emaciated like the rest of the German population? Is she foreign? She doesn't look American. And why is the man carrying the briefcase wearing such a nice dark suit? Is he perhaps a foreign journalist? What if he's a German businessman hurrying along and unperturbed by the disasters to his immediate right? There are, however, what we might call instinctive parameters of response. I'm coming close to the end of my comments in case you're wondering. If I know that the woman in the foreground is German and I am a Nazi survivor, or from one of the Nazi occupied countries or Jewish, or again, part of the allies, I will not see this woman as I will if I know she's not German and not an ex Nazi. If I know the photographer is French, which we do know, I will not respond to this photograph as I might if we were told the photographer is German. A Londoner who lived through the Blitz will not see this image as say a Berliner trying to put his or her life back together again at the end of the war and so on. Moreover, I'm likely to feel less empathy in viewing this photograph in 1945 than I might today. But empathy for whom? For the couple walking down the street? For the businessman? Not likely. If I look carefully at the ruins, I see long shards of buildings rising up in the midst of the debris. You see them there, there, and there, and there. Empathy for the corpses that lie underneath that pile of rubble, or perhaps at least for the children who were buried alive. 60,000 children were killed in the air raids. I should tell you a, a short story. When I gave this talk at the Sorbonne a few years ago, uh, and I was talking about what I'm talking about now. Afterwards in the Q&A, a man in the front row said, I don't see what the problem is, they're just Germans. And I said, you know, that's echoing the Nazi view, they're just Jews. So anyway, uh, the trouble with empathy, as more than one philosopher has noted, is that it can be a self-serving way of feeling that one is a good person, covering over an unacknowledged satisfaction in knowing that a horrific revenge has been inflicted on the victor, by the victor, sorry. Or it can be a way of justifying the horrors visited upon innumerable victims of the Nazi regime. If I then think about the German bombings the Germans who bombed, in other words, Guernica, London, Coventry, to mention the most obvious, am I then filled with righteous indignation? Here's a continuation of the previous image. Note the military convoy passing. It's American, there are stars on the vehicles. The journalist Stieg Dagerman, whom if you don't know, I really urge you to read his book, Autumn. Um, Dagerman noted that the Germans of the war's end could not be regarded as quote, one solid block irradiating the Nazi chill, but rather as a multitude of starving and fleeing individuals. Collective guilt, argues Dagerman, is too easy for the victors and the suffering of the German civilian population in the bombed out ruins. While it may satisfy at least, or at least offer a modicum of justice to those who suffered under the Nazi regime, it remains an ethical question. 
Dagerman had contempt, quote, for the naive and cruel notion that the German people as a whole deserve, quote, unquote, their suffering. He interviewed death camp survivors, Nazis, and ordinary people sitting on the charred ruins of their home. He gives us no answers, but his, he's staunch in his conviction that collective guilt is unacceptable. His ethical stance then is to show empathy for all suffering, for what is ethically and precisely deserved suffering. The same guy who asked me what's wrong with this, this just Germans, I said to him, a lot of children were killed. And he said, oh, well, children, that's different. And a friend said, I should have said, how old do they have to be before we get to kill them? So the images we've looked at lie in one kind of present. The beholder sees now in the immediacy of his or her gaze with the distance of a pretty long stretch of time. So let's remember that the other present is the suffering occurring in the world now. I, you know, Myanmar, for example, to which these images of the past should serve as an echo even as they often work paradoxically to help the holder put the horror aside by aestheticizing the image. Memory and amnesia do not necessarily contradict each other or they are not contradictory. They work in tandem, alternating like electric currents. So too seeing and refusing to see. These are incongruities that will not be tamed and that no amount of theorizing or moralizing will domesticate. So my book is a tenuous hope that the viewer will be able to, will want even to see these images somewhat differently now. And I have two more images to share with you with that hope in mind. And the last one, Christy. Okay, so thank you. And let's have some questions. Wonderful, yes, let's have some questions um the floor the digital and otherwise is open for anybody who wants to ask a question uh, one two three these things you know as you know by now they take place in real time today and then they're recorded so there's a new consumerism of zoom events that watches them later as a movie of sorts and so they come in later um, but I think um, I will start maybe just um, asking one or two questions that gives you all a little bit more time. One thing that I find intriguing, or let me make one comment and then ask maybe a question. There's something very specific about these German ruins, and that has been often noted in particular about Berlin, and that is that most of the destroyed buildings were built around the end of the 19th century, and therefore they didn't quite flatten, but stand up in this kind of really weird and bizarre ways because the, of the use of steel. And so that creates this very airy kind of sense of these gapping holes as you're describing it. So there's something I think that just has to do with the architecture as well. But what I think is interesting is the, uh, I wanna like see if you know maybe a little bit more about it. You've asked about what the photos want, what the photographer wants. Um, is a, one question that I have is really the duration of when these photos were taken. You give us one marker and you say it's May 1945, but then there are quite a few photos that show the Americans. And the Americans are not there in May 45, they come a little bit later, which means there's a little bit of time that is passing. And I think being the historian time always I find is intriguing. And so that speaks to the intention of the photographer that there's an ongoing engagement with this and an ongoing purpose. It's not just quickly done but it also means what is captured, you know, presumably already um, different scenes of sorts, because we do know that 
strangely enough, Berlin recovers into a kind of routine of life of people going from to work very quickly. It doesn't take that long. And so we're therefore seeing this strange kind of duration. So do you know anything more about the, so to speak, the timetable of all of this? Uh, in a word, no. Um, I wish I did. Um, what I do know is that uh, she started photographing with the Allied victory as soon as she got to Germany. And she got to Germany in 1945 in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so all of these photographs are taken in one way or another in Germany immediately after the war. But that's all I know, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good question and a very important one, particularly from the point of view of a historian such as yourself. I can't answer it. I didn't even know. And I should also say that the negatives have been lost, oh, yeah. which drove my editor completely crazy. Um, so we had to digitally reproduce the photographs and you can see they purposely left the little, uh, edges, you know, that are typical of photographs from the 40s. Um, so I, I wish I could answer that. Can I maybe just while, while I have the privilege, I might as well make use of it, uh, follow and, up with another, another question. And that is, um, you know, if, if you kind of compare the descriptions that we otherwise have of Berlin by journalists and and others who are returning in that same time frame, Hannah Arendt, you mentioned one of them. I mean, she is back in Germany in 46, Peter Weiss and others. They, they seem to almost, you know, describe exactly what these photos are capturing. They're intrigued by the same kind of, you know, these gapping kind of buildings of sorts. So it's a, the, the quote unquote, Trümmer liter literature that we have, the rune literature is also very visual and, and it's almost in the same manner uh, capturing what they see. But I always thought it also had to do a little bit with the fact that ultimately what you call the catastrophe had already occurred and was almost impossible to describe. I mean, what we know from the early bombings of 43 onwards is that most of what has come to, what, you know, describe the impossibility really of capturing the kind of incendiary bombs, the explosions, the fires and so on and so forth. So that, you know, Considering the context of your lecture and the kind of moment of the humanities and arts, one wonders what ability do the humanities or the arts have actually to capture the catas catastrophe? Well, that's the question of my book. Yes. Uh, to what extent can catastrophe be represented? And I really never answer that question. Uh, no, that's why I thought I have you here now and I'm going to ask you that. No, I still don't know what the answer is. I do know, for example, that, um, you know, Hannah Arendt, as I'm sure you know, wrote this thing, Report from Germany. That's right. Which I found very annoying um, because she keeps saying that the Germans are indifferent. They don't seem to care about the war. They don't want to talk about it. Um, and, you know, I think she completely underestimates the trauma of what the German population went through. Um, you know, trauma is something we understand with Holocaust survivors. Um, and much has been written about that. But the trauma of being bombed for four years is not something that Arendt even discusses. The only person who really discusses it is Dagerman, mm -hmm. Stieg Dagerman. Um, so that's something I want to say. I mean, obviously my perspective is, not to put too fine a point on it, war is a disaster. And when you are killed or buried or uh, otherwise destroyed, your home is destroyed, you know, whether it's by allied bombing and that technology of war machinery or whether it is in the death camps, which I have been saying nonstop are a different problem and a horrific one. Uh, it doesn't change the fact that uh, war is a catastrophe. 
Well, and, you know, that's in a way that what those photos do capture. It's this kind of state of homelessness in the immediate aftermath. Um, and, you know, that's one of the other remarkable features of many of the German cities after 45 is that, for example, you mentioned children that and thousands of thousands of children without parents and without homes who are just itinerant between these various ruins of sorts and are caught in there. And I think, yes, this question of equivalencies and empathies is, is it, you know, it was perplexing to Aaron, but remains perplexing to Germans to this day, how to account for their sense of suffering of, you know, in the course of these uh, bombings and obviously at the same time accounting for their guilt and responsibility for the Holocaust, as well as for the attacks on, on the other cities. I, this is to this day in the existing museums and ruins in Germany, a circle that cannot be squared. And it's, it's impossible to bring these two together. So it seems without causing trouble in one way or another. And as but you will, know, yes. in the 80s, um, the German uh, historians uh, had this streit um, yes. in which they were saying, some of them, may I, I don't want to generalize, some of them were saying, um, see, we suffered too, to the Holocaust, which is ethically unacceptable as well. But the fact is they did struggle. I mean, in other words, they did the, how should I put this? They put themselves at a disadvantage by trying to compare their situation with victims and survivors of the Holocaust. And that is unacceptable. So the question becomes, how can you recognize the suffering of the German civilian population without trying to compare it to the Holocaust? Uh, so that is a very complicated problem. Indeed. Um, and there are no real um, easy answers to this one. Um, let me now more seriously open up the floor um, to everyone else who wants to ask some questions um, to come in. I think Katie, you have your hand up, right? Yeah, more of an observation um, than a question. And it's, Wait, I was- Katie? I don't see Katie. Oh, oh up here, sorry. I'm here. Okay. Wave um, your hands. I, I, I was- you. I was struck by the angle of the photographs because obviously um, it's from someone standing on the street holding it. And now uh, we see all of these images, you know, sort of the, the God I view from drone footage. And that's, that's quite a different perspective to, to put it, the viewer in the situation of a person on the street, the same level. I think that um, brings up this experience of, um, putting me in the shoes of your mom yeah, in some no, ways. That's right. I and think it, that's right. it brings up empathy in a different way than uh, some kind of helicopter, which would be from the pers perspective of the aggressor in some ways. I think that's a really good point. Um, and, uh, you know, it's different from today. Somebody in Oklahoma pushes a button and eight people in, in Syria die or something. Um, I think that's right. I also, well, there's several things to say. First of all, I think that um, any professional photographer will tell you that you can tell this is the work of an amateur because there's too much street. You know, there's too much foreground before you get to the ruins with some exceptions. Um, but I also think, uh, as your point is so well taken, that it's why my mother didn't want to get too close to the population because she was right there. And so she backed up a lot or took people with their backs turned to her. Um, do you want, do you guys want Christy to show you the photographs again, just sort of scroll through them slowly or no? Does anybody want to see them again? Because, well, you don't have to see them again, but the point is that the, the foregrounding, the, the, the ground is too prominent as far as a professional photographer is concerned. Um, I uh, worked a lot with photographers to write this book, one of whom was Alan Cohen, who's written a lot of interesting books, one of which is called European Ground and which is photographs of the actual ground at Auschwitz. Um, 
And so he was training me to read the photographs because I've never worked with photographs before. And that's the first thing he said was you can tell your mother was not a professional because she has too much of the street in front of the ruins. Mm -hmm. Now, other people, and I'll be interested to know what you think about this, Katie, other people thought, no, on the contrary, um, it shows that she is at their level and not in a helicopter, not in a, in a bomber, uh, et cetera. So. I think we have a, another question, Sarah Valente, right? Yes. Yes, first of all, thank you so much. This was an incredibly interesting lecture and very moving as well. And I know you were conscious of time, but I could have listened to you for another hour looking at these oh, images. And I have a question, but just to Katie's point, something that I did notice that I think is really interesting goes to the point that she was just making is that in that first photographs where we see the blown up bridge and the two men side by side, you can tell that the, in the second photograph, the photographer has moved a step closer to the men as well. Um, just because of the positioning of the of the building in the background, you can tell that she has moved a little bit. So I thought as I was watching that, you know, maybe her approach, you know, approaching them had also startled them in some way. So that, you know, was something that I, I wanted to mention, but. Or um, maybe, would you agree with, maybe as I suggested, they were friends. It could be, right. And it could that's be. why she felt comfortable photographing them head on. I don't Absolutely. know. Yeah, absolutely. And now you raised some really interesting questions, some of them, of course, which are, I think, unanswerable. But I wanted to ask a question um, on more of a biographical note. Um, when did you discover these photos? Um, did your mother ever talk to you about having made these photos? Or did your father, did you ever had any kind of, you know, conversations about the ways in which they might have um, or she might have you know, recorded what she saw or what he knew about the work that she was doing. Because I think you started the presentation in a really interesting way, talking about the fact you know, that she really was not allowed to work at that time. And she was in some ways very constrained in her situation as a French woman married to an American in Germany. Um, did you ever have these kinds of conversations about the photographs as well as her um, experience in that specific category? Again, in a word, no. Mm -hmm. um, all I knew was that she had taken pictures of the ruins in Germany. She did tell me that. I didn't know where they were. Um, she never, and you know, you know how it is in life, you know, we sort of dropped that. And I was young and not particularly interested in the ruins in Germany. And so we didn't go on. I, so in um, 26 years ago, when my mother died, I was cleaning out her house. And uh, there was this chest, which I didn't have the key to, um, and which was moved to my house in Chicago, as was. And I finally got a, uh, a locksmith to come and figure out how to open the chest without a key, which was no small thing because the chest is from the 18th century. And when I opened it, uh, that's when I found the photographs of the ruins. And I looked desperately for the negatives, but I couldn't find them. So the only thing my mother said to me, as I noted in my talk, was that taking the photographs was exhausting because she was caught between empathy on the one hand and humanitarian concern for the suffering that was so obvious and the other feeling of serves you right. You have to remember my mother was, not only in the resistance in Paris, but she was also shot at by the Gestapo more than once. Oh, wow. And also hid in a basement apartment for six weeks because um, the Gestapo was after her. So, and during those six weeks, my little cousin who was 10, I think at the time, um, would, was told when he walked to school to take, his mother would say, who's my mother's sister, take this bag and just drop it in the uh, cellar well on your way to school. So he never knew what was in that bag, which was food and water. I, I don't think I answered your question, but. <laughs> no, thank you, that, that was great. And were there ever any letters attached to these photos? Did you find anything else in the chest? I'm just curious. <laughs> no, okay. There were letters that she wrote 
I, um, it's very sad. She wrote um, in-depth letters to her sister who was in Paris okay. about the ruins. And when her sister died, my uncle, her husband burned the letters. Oh, sorry to hear that. So I don't have them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are uh, one or two other kind of comments and questions also in the chat. So let me just uh, you know read out the paraphrase. The first one that says, well, the fact that the streets seem to be taking up so much space may not necessarily have to be taken as an amateur mistake, but indeed it could be the focus because in lots of ways, the cleared out streets do suggest that there's life that has returned, that people are moving, cars are moving, and therefore maybe that is the true story that in between the ruins, there's already the beginning of life again and people are kind of coming and going. So that's uh, more an observation and you can comment on it. The, the, the other one is, you know, I combine this a little bit with what you just said, this kind of being located in the midst of all that and feeling this push and pull, so to speak. It would have been a difficult situation to locate oneself considering that this is also the beginning of the Cold War that the Soviets are not any longer quite the allies, they're already changing roles. And then as Katie, I think also rightly notes, as a woman being out on the streets, I mean, that's with a camera that also, you know, would have placed your mom into, into a potentially problematic position as well as being outside an observer, but also up you know, a spectacle herself um, for, for the various participating, you know, moving around male figures, whether German, French, Italian, uh, Soviets, and so on and so forth. So this whole terrain is, is really a messy one, I, it would seem, and would have been the least of, of a stable and safe um, in that period. So that therefore there's also maybe something about these photos that they were probably not taken necessarily with a contemplative mind or moment always, um, you know, available. What do you think about that? Well, um, it's clear that the population that she was photographing was either ignoring her or was pretty hostile mm -hmm. uh, because they would have felt like animals in a zoo being photographed. Um, and you're right, it was very dangerous for a woman. There was the, the one photograph where you see the ruins and you see a, an American car. That was my father's car, apparently. So he did accompanying her, accompany her several mm. times, but it was dangerous. And she was almost raped in the Tiergarten um, mm. and uh, managed to run away. But a woman alone with a camera was not an obvious thing. I agree with you. I mean, I didn't talk Thank about that in the book, but you're absolutely yeah. right. Thank you. Well, I'm paraphrasing what Katie observed. So this is uh, comes more from, from there. Um, any other questions, observations, uh, comments? You can also attack me. I'm very open to being attacked. That's good to know. All <laughs> right, now we, we switch on you. Now we come after you. That's very good to know. Uh, Professor Schulte, you, Reiner, you are muted, Reiner. So you're almost there. He's still muted. He's still this. Uh... Well, I want to thank everybody for coming on a Friday afternoon. Um, we certainly have enjoyed having you here. And, um, you know, this is now a new series that we are, that we launched uh, largely actually Reiner and I, and uh, we do that always on a, he is unmuted. So let, let's, uh, let me shut up. Am I still I muted? Just... No, yeah. you're not. We hear you. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a personal comment because that's, since I'm one of the oldest here, this is how I was brought up. And for me, this is associations that I don't want to go in, but I thought that Francoise gave a very, very elaborate, uh, comprehensive recreation of the atmosphere that I, as a child, experienced. And to me, this is not to be talked about, but this is a emotional association as I was walking through and see all these, uh, these ruins. And I, I grew up in ruins and so on. So I just wanted to thank you for 
recreating and revitalizing my memories. I'm not too sure whether that I actually want. Well, so. Reiner, I would like to thank you for having helped in my formation, mm -hmm. in my education. Um, I remember Professor Schulte's classes very well. They were always very exciting. And one of his favorite sentences was, at this point in my life, and he would, he would talk about literature, problems in literature and situations. And then he would say, at this point in my life, anyway, that is a wonderful memory of mine. Yes, I know you played in the ruins um, and saw the ruins uh, during the war. I saw them after the war um, and we weren't, as children, we weren't supposed to go anywhere near the ruins, but of course we did. And um, I remember very well the, you know, the places where you could see where a picture had been hanging on the wallpaper, where you could see where the staircase had been. Um, all of these traces of, of life um, were pretty powerful for a small child. Um, so, and, and, uh, the grown-ups kept telling us not to go play in the ruins, but it was different for children then. We weren't, we didn't have helicopter parents, and so they didn't follow us around. And so, of course, we went to the ruins. The other thing that I want to say is, which is an indication which you didn't touch upon, is being in the cellar when the bombs were coming down. And this was the shaking before it could become ruins. And in many cases, they did become ruins. But you were always that moment of uncertainty when the downstairs of the house was beginning to move. And obviously, the German houses are much better built in the cellar than we hear. And whenever I see the ruins right now, that immediately reminds me that I was lucky that the ruin didn't kill me. Yes, exactly. As, as it was collapsing, because yeah, nobody... Yeah, well, as, as I, I mentioned that in my talk, you know, the, this person who says you have to imagine how much debris and what a mountain of it it is of a five-story apartment building or a house or anything else. And it's also true that the uh, cellars um, were pro extremely horrible because if uh, the bombs caused fires, they went from cellar to cellar because the cellars were frequently connected. I think it is important that the memory, the, the memory of what happened, including, as you have said very clearly, the Holocaust, that it becomes part of the history of the education. Oh, absolutely. And that's what I see that it's not happening. No, I-, I Well, I mean, it's, maybe I jump in, you know, that's, it really remains complicated. And if you take Berlin today, if you visit Berlin, even the former East by now reveals very few remnants of these former ruins. You still see some bullet shots here, there in buildings, but all in all, it had largely become invisible. What you do have is the famous church, the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche, which remains in the state as it was uh, from the air raids. But I think there's a, because you talk so much about rubble, I cannot help but mentioned that if you know Berlin, it's a very flat land. It's not- Well, that's, what I, was, that's what I was saying about why uh, the, uh, the deaths were not as large as they might have been in a different kind of city. It's flat and it's also right. dispersed. But, but, the, but today, the only mountains that you do have in Berlin where kids enjoying like their winter time where they can go you know, with their slides are made out of rubble. So the yes. whole rubble was eventually pushed together and the only existing mountains that you have in, in and around Berlin are these former rubble mountains. Nowadays, obviously all covered up in green and therefore it's invisible, but it's one of the last physical remnants of the period that you brought back so well for us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you all. Um, I think we give you real applause. Uh, we give you electronic applause. Um, <laughs> thank you. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much again. Thank you for inviting thank me, you. both of you. Have all a good weekend, everyone. Yes. Bye-bye. Thank you.